I'm Matt Reynolds, and this is my podcast. Tessa, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Now, I wanted to start with your, you're a traveler by nature. Mm -hmm. In 2014, you took advantage of the then rise of the Wi-Fi kid, mm -hmm. as you just put it before we start, mm -hmm. and you took off to the US. Yep. What happened? So I had been working in fashion at that stage for about four years in the industry after graduating from my degree. And I was working for a business who was developing product in South America. So I was able to travel to and from South America quite a lot from Australia. And I then grabbed the laptop and took a move to North America and was able to work from whatever Wi-Fi cafe I wanted for about two years or so. And in that time, I made the move to South America, which was absolutely game changing. Um, and certainly changed my path in fashion and in production and taught me or actually made very evident what my role in fashion was doing to the planet and how I needed to make change. And what did you see that was well eye-opening even for you who was working in the industry at the time because we associate luxury brands particularly with sort of um, you know opulence and all, all the rest that goes yeah. with it but we don't often consider behind the scenes so what mm. did you see that uh, and, and what did you learn so interestingly I've been a fashion designer now for 15 or so years and I grew up with a really sustainably minded um, family who we were never allowed plastic really we had everything was in paper sandwich paper and um, you know homemade everything and still to the day my parents are exactly the same and I never thought that that was unusual but I always knew that I wanted to be a fashion designer so I grew up with this um, creative side of me making fashionable clothes as I thought they were out of things like fly wire or you know anything that I could find I was using a, a different material for and then I got into the fashion industry and I started to see it from the Victor I was working in Melbourne and I was able to develop I was a shoe de developer and um, a number of different roles and I sort of saw the industry side of things and until I got to South America I didn't really understand the factory side of things and it was 2014 and I had been living in Peru for quite some time and one of the afternoons and I'd seen everyone picking and packing the boxes that were about to be exported out and all of the plastic bags that every single t-shirt that I was developing myself was going into, um, was going into these boxes to be shipped back to Australia. And I took a bus ride out through the mountains and it was supposed to be a really picturesque, beautiful bus ride. And as I looked down the mountain top, there were half the plastic bags that I had just seen that was my responsibility to having ordered this amount of t-shirts and placing that purchase order. And even thinking about it now, it gives me shivers on my arms because they were just strewn across the mountain. And I knew that that was my responsibility and I needed to change. And I was 26 at the time. So it was a big pivotal moment for me. So the bags, they were like leftover bags? Yeah, they, they were, were just, um, they were from product that had come in that they'd ripped out of, um, you know, if it was yarn for example because they were spinning their own yarn yep. and the yarn would come in, in in sacks and plastics and then be stripped out and thrown you know it was it's not the Peruvian factory's fault per se it's actually the way in which there was no um, management for trash so there's no trash management and there yep. was no infrastructure in place to manage any of this and also there was a complete and there still is um, a level of ignorance that if we if it's out of sight it's out of mind or this concept of throwing things away that it's going somewhere which it's not because there is no such thing as away and this was so interesting to me because I'd watched from the front end of this factory who were picking and packing and putting into boxes all of the things that I had placed the purchase order and signed for and on the back of the factory was the disposal and the plastics that were coming in and going out and up and down this hill. And, you know, we're watching these trucks driving up and over, you know, these canyons and there's nowhere to put the trash. So they rise the tr back of the truck and out goes the trash straight down the mountain. And oh, it was just mountain. heartbreaking. Yeah. yeah. So I knew then that whatever I did from that day forth had to be very mindful of the environment. I had probably already had that upbringing, which really helped me to see that it was possible to live a different lifestyle but yeah that was the, the moment I guess so have you ever thought why you reacted that way in that moment because people could see that and 
go on with their day and, and not worry about it. But for some reason for you, that moment in time, it struck a chord that Mm. has changed your direction which we'll we'll get to hugely but have you thought about why that actually happened at all i guess you know like any ignorant young fashion designer or any person who graduates from any sort of or does any sort of training and then you know wants to live in this big dream world of being a fashion designer the the level the way we sometimes put these blinkers on our eyes to see only what we want to see and i had been you know brought up just to know that well, not even that plastic wasn't good, but that we just didn't use it. We didn't need it. Mm-hmm. And so I always had this had an inherent nature not to really opt for things that were in single-use plastic. It wasn't really how we ever thought of things. We always bought things yeah. in bulk or they were, they were my, made. My parents make everything, as I said before. Yeah. And so this, that, that visual of seeing this truck dump this plastic down the mountain as I'm going up to see this beautiful, pristine part of the Andes and look out across this incredible canyon and this this unbelievable sight. It struck me, I think, mainly because I could no longer hide from it. I couldn't just put my blinkers on and pretend, but I'm living this great fashionable lifestyle and doing all these raw. things. Yeah, it was, it was the chord. Yeah. yeah. So what did you do from that point forward? Do you remember what you, you, you first did? Yes, I remember marching into the factory office and I was I was speaking pidgin Spanish at the time. I had had to learn because that was the obviously they speak Spanish in Peru. So I started getting really emotional in my faux Latino accent and I asked them about biodegradable plastic and they sort of scratched their heads and it was really I mean it was 2014 so it was a different era. Yeah. They knew that it was available but they weren't really sure how or where and um so I set this path in motion to get potato um, turned into plastic, which was, I don't know if you know much about Peru, but they have 17 different types of potatoes and I love their potatoes. And um, so potatoes is a very uh, regular food source as well as able to make really good bioplastics out of. So that was one side. I had to make sure that the factory could create it. Mm -hmm. And then I had to start on the negotiations with the company I was working for to add that extra 14 cents per garment, which was the cost per bioplastic bag. Yes. So that was a tough, really tough dis- discussion. Um, I knew that if 14... that didn't pivot, that would be a breaker for me. Sorry to cut you off. That's um, okay. 14 cents to a lot of these garments doesn't sound like much to us, but it's huge no. at back at that early stage of yeah. production, right? So Yeah, it is. You can, you can literally be sitting, you know, in conversations trying to get – 70 cents is a huge jump between yes. six dollars and six dollars 70 and we're talking us dollars as well yeah. so 14 cents it doesn't sound like a lot but when it's a plastic bag and there's a cheaper option and you're just trying to land a t-shirt for x y you know for low cost because yeah. there's not a, we don't place a lot of value in now product particularly in 2014 right? especially in 2014 you probably argue now that we're really starting to open our eyes to a lot of these things but but, uh, back then not not so much so did they listen to you did they change did um did it did it start to happen how did it go down it was a tough conversation i mean it was a small startup brand that i've been working with i was with them for seven years i learned almost everything i know now from how that business was run and who i was working with um, they were um, hesitant at first because obviously margins and they were all the same age as I am. So, you know, early 30s, it was it was definitely their make or break kind of brand. And they were definitely resistant. And, but after a few conversations, they, they had adopted to it quickly. They they, yeah, they, they did. Okay. Um, and we ended up getting these really cool, really cool now. It's 2020. You'd expect everyone has biodegradable plastic bags. But at the time, there was no biodegradable bags on any product. Um, so, yeah, we got these cool bags made up out of potato starch and branded with our logos and things that I believed in written on them about um, Mother Nature being our home girl, and got them. Our product came in in those after that, and after that, all of our um, packaging, everything was recycled, and it was it was still a uphill battle a bit, but yeah. you know, pivoting any business from how it how it knows it can work and operate and profit, and into something that's greener or you know better values is always a challenge. Yes, but yeah, it was a worthy cause. There's a real key marketing element here, isn't there? Because 
as things start to change, you mm. can really use that to differentiate yourself, uh, differentiate yourself, goodness, differentiate even yep. <laughs> yourself from other maybe more established brands by using that story. Yeah. But having a new story accepted and communicated can be quite challenging. Yeah. Right? So, what did you do to 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 try and communicate that? Was there a big change in the in the focus there? Um. Because I had been with the business for so long and I knew the founders so well, it it was very evident my change. I mean, I feel like I must okay. have even looked different. I, I had come back from South America being this, I'm not going to say gypsy, but I was very much aware of what, I, what my values were, which was yeah. in ethical and sustainable fashion. And I was really banging that drum. I, I had a gut feeling and a, and I'd seen enough to know that this was the way that the industry was going to change. Mm-hmm. Um not all of my values were accepted or um, pushed through the way that I would have liked them to. And, yeah. you know, that led me to going out and doing my own thing later on. But for the most part, it was such an interesting time because it, it wasn't a trendy thing to be sustainable. Yeah. It was almost dorky and it wasn't cool to care. It didn't, you know, it was ethical fashion wasn't it, it wasn't what it is today. Yeah. Um, it certainly was there, especially from the landmarks we've got in our history of fashion in the last 10 years alone um and what has turned us into this ethical um space now um as an industry we're really waking up waking up to what we need to be doing um but that wasn't necessarily a talking point and so it, it was a bit of an uphill battle at times um still got a friendship with the the boys that i worked with okay but um yeah and then you, it's, you obviously decided to do your own thing. Yeah. Which is where your bags and brand yep. started. So at what point was that? Why did you choose bags? Where, where did that idea come from? So in my um, awakening, my gypsy yep. phase, I really started looking into sustainability and what that meant for the things that I was using Mm -hmm. and the things that I was eating. So there are two big F words, I think, in um the, on the planet and that is food and fashion and if we looked at both of those industries they are the most influential of trends and markets that we can we yeah. have and i looked into well i unbeknown to me watched a documentary that caused me to stop eating meat and adopted a plant-based lifestyle and from that i stopped buying leather okay. um, luckily for me or interestingly enough for me Prior to working with the business in South America, I had been a leather developer. And if I was no longer going to buy leather, I could buy plastic or PU or pleather or polyurethane is the actual term for it, which is that, um, you know, what they call vegan leather, which bothers me endlessly because it's it's neither of those things. Um, Because the first iteration of a lot of these products being vegan leather, as you said. Yeah probably a lot worse to my understanding than the original yep. right so we've sort of gone through this evolution in a lot of different industries as we've yeah you know, as we've gone to correct a few of those things yeah but because it was a plastic base is that right yeah so it's alternative yeah you're adding to the pollution um oils is, your, your polymers it cannot break down you know my biggest plight was that if you cared about the animals then you care about the planet if you care about the planet then why are you buying a plastic bag and I, that okay. you know left me looking into leather and why leather is so toxic and actually the interesting part or the other side of that is that if you're to buy a leather bag it's no longer a natural product under your arm because whilst it came from a, the skin of an animal yes it's been treated so many times to avoid it rotting whilst you carry it that it's been the chemicals that are imp- that are embedded in it. Once that goes into land, they leach into the planet, and it's just as terrible as plastic. So it's a lesser of evils, you know. Where what's where do you put your money? Where do you what do you purchase without you know? How slippery is the slope? That's right. Yeah. yeah <laughs> exactly. So you looked for an alternative. For- yeah, I I knew that if I was going to do my own business, it had to be... Well, firstly, I was trying to buy a handbag, to be honest with you. Okay. <laughs> and I couldn't buy a bag that wasn't plastic and I couldn't buy a bag that was leather. So I started, what, I started researching as much as I could. 
and this material called Pinatex had just been developed and I'd seen it on Facebook and okay. it was this um, advert saying leather made from pineapple fiber or something like yeah. that and I looked into it a bit more and I was not so sure about it at the start of using it but growing with that business has been eye-opening to say the least in textile innovation and um, what they now can do with that material is really interesting but yes it's made from the fibers of a pineapple plant so there's and, and there's quite a bit obviously with between can't buy a bag yep seeing an advert on, on facebook, facebook and then actually holding a bag so how did that work for you because um that's not easy to put together right no it was such an it yeah, I think this is where Q stage left my business partner steps into my life. Okay. Um, so I've always been a very creative person coming up with, you know, I knew what the brand looked like. Yep. I knew what in my head, how this would play out in terms of I knew what styles looked like. I knew that it had to be function over fashion. It had to satisfy all these X, Y, Z things. But let's say that my um, appetite for going and doing those things on my own is not the greatest yeah, and okay. <laughs> uh, I was um, I was practicing at a yoga studio and the girl behind the counter, this little British thing, was behind the counter and we started having these conversations about sustainability and plastics and what have you and I'm a bit of an oversharer and I described the brand that I had in my mind and I didn't let her get a word in, which I don't know if you can tell, that's a yeah. thing for, <laughs> for me. And by the end of the conversation she said, well, that's funny, I'm doing the same business as you. And I thought oh my gosh, no, you're not. You're a yoga teacher. There's no way in the world you're doing this exact same business as me. And it turned out she'd been working on the blueprint for the exact same brand, but she was, as I said, a yoga teacher. Little did I know she was a sales and marketing guru from London oh, and, okay. um, and operations and account management. And so she was the exact piece of the puzzle that I needed okay. to get the ball in motion. Yeah. So with her on operations and finance and, um, legal and yeah. me doing creative and branding and visuals we got and, and a lot of her momentum which is dog and a bone she sees a problem she'll she chases it like it, after it. yeah, yeah. one of the key real, qualities of a yeah. entrepreneur right you yeah. need to someone to have that in your organization or things don't get done yeah so. you need an ideas and you need a doer and together we work really well together not that she doesn't come up with ideas she's very full of ideas but she's also go getter and go doer which and you're still um, partners today? You still yeah. Okay, yeah. awesome. So we're 50-50 ownership of the brand and we work... She actually lives in New South Wales and okay. I live in Melbourne. Yeah. So she's in Sydney, I'm in Melbourne and we call ourselves National. Yes. No, that's <laughs> um, good to give that perception. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just the two of us at the moment. It's been an 18-month journey to the date, to where we are now. Yeah. And it's been a, an industry change that I cannot even begin to explain how different this landscape is today. So just to go back to the bag mm -hmm. uh, really quickly, you obviously, I'm assuming, sketched it out. You had your, your design ideas and that sort of thing. Did you like just buy a roll of this material in and start stitching it together yourself or do you get it manufactured <laughs> oh, somewhere? Or? If only it was that easy. No. So because it's a textile innovation, so how it's made is through um, – Stripping out the leaves of the pineapple plant, they're then felted together in a non-woven way. So I don't know if you've ever seen felt being made like wool, where they strip out all these fibers and then they heat them or press them and they roll them into a new material. Oh, and they stick and that they forms stick. the fabric. Okay, That's yeah. what essentially Pinatex or pineapple fibers have done here. Yeah. And um, because of this innovation, they were impossible to get our hands on. They weren't giving, they weren't working with any small startups, you know, they, as and rightly so, they had their eyes set on the big players of the game. They knew that they'd get a higher purchase prices, et cetera, et cetera, you know, yeah. economies of scale. So Susie, my beloved business partner, had enough of them ignoring her and took a flight to London and sat on the doorstep until they let her in and then she sat in reception until they finally finished for the day and she said, I'm Susie, I've been emailing you for months, would you please just give me some sampling? Yeah. So they gave us five metres to sample with. Okay. Which was probably where the problems um, got thicker, I guess. We're yeah. working with an innovative material. It's plant-based. No one's ever used it before. We've got to find a bag maker. We've got to work with a bag maker who's only ever used leather, who's not really as um, 
pioneering in that space and mentally as, as we probably needed. We needed someone who was like, right, plant-based is where the future is. Let's learn how to do it. He, he wasn't necessarily as, um, as gung-ho as that. He yes. was very much a leather developer. But he worked with us really well for the first sort of nine, ten months, um, taught us how to use the material. Okay. And um, it's been a journey to uh, make sure that everything within the, sp- the handbag, each handbag has got either a recycled component if you, to make sure that it's strong enough, um, to make sure it's been backed and finished off the way that has a durability um, factor about it. Otherwise, we're creating more problems for, for the fashion industry, really. Yeah, so there's two things in there. There's, there's using um, materials in a sustainable way and then there's the other aspect which i know you've addressed which is actually bringing back materials that have gone to waste and actually reusing them so these bags if i've got my um, information correct contain parts of old yoga mats Mm -hmm. they contain parts of abseiling ropes and where did these i'm fascinated with how like these all come together i know you obviously practice yoga because you yeah, said yeah. so was there a point where you're like we need this to be softer so we should i don't know line this with a yoga yeah. mat or like how so, does it sort of happen well if you think about it and it probably doesn't apply to you but if i say this to most women i'll say i've carried a handbag since i was 14 years of age and i've never i was very early adopter of a handbag and i never cut it in half around the um circumference and yes. looked inside okay but there's always plastic in there so there's car- heavy cardboard or heavy plastics mm-hmm. and that's what gives the bag structure so if you're looking to replace virgin oh, materials sort of almost like that fluffy kind of like yeah. buoyant kind of mm-hmm. feel or look yeah that's right and okay. it either makes the bag stand up it gives it um durability you know then on the outside it's always got like a either a patent plastic or a patent leather or there's always some form of plastic within it yeah and because we were making in Sydney, and my business partner is a yoga teacher, we had access to umpteen amounts of yoga mats that were being um, discarded because they were no longer used. Um, we had small batch production, so we could put essentially anything we wanted into these bags. Mm-hmm. And we needed a material that was two millimeters thick, had a rubber-like feeling about it, and you know the bag maker we were working with showed us what he was already using, which yeah. was virgin material of this sort of look. Mm-hmm. And Susie said, well, that looks like a yoga mat, and I know exactly where to get those. Yeah. So we, are, we were able to work with um, yoga mats, and abseiling ropes was the next interesting one because... Um, so this was, 20, this was 2017 we started working together, and the word got out pretty quickly that we were using waste to create new luxury bag pro- or n- luxury products mm-hmm. and it was very interesting who would call us we would have people calling us saying you know i work for x y and z and i don't know what to do with this and you know my boss just says to put it in the bin but i don't really want to do that could you do something with it and we would go out to i went out to a place in nunawading and looked at all of his posters that he'd made of banners and things and it had all been um boxed up to go to landfill he couldn't bear to do it so he was hiding them in the back of the warehouse and he wanted me to do something with it but the abseiling ropes was um similar where they said we've got all these ropes we've tested them they hold two tons worth of you know weight and now we've got to put it in the bin because we've tested it to its end end degree yeah um do you want to use them because you don't need to carry two tons worth of stuff on your handbag. Well, you shouldn't. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so we would put them on the inside of our, our, of our straps. Okay. So I don't know if you've ever seen a tubular strap on a handbag. They I have, yeah. I've, I've, uh, in preparation of this, I've sort of taken a, a bit more of a notice of handbags than that, which I must admit I've really never had before. So Yeah. Yeah. So the to keep to get a hand a handle tubular, there's usually a piece of rope in that. Okay. And then yeah. it's flattened out and put onto this onto the handbag itself. We used abseiling rope to get our, you know, we, our intention was to always use waste. Yep. And when you look at the bag itself, you would never know that it had that in it until I told you yes. yeah. <laughs> or until you dug a bit deeper. I think we call it scratch the surface on the website where, you know, we'll tell you a bit about the bag, but if you really want to know more, you can click the next tab and find out more because we also realize that we don't want to be giving you overload of information for most people. Yeah. So how many of these different bags do you, in different styles do you make? So we're currently in, we just finished collection two, I'm about to launch collection three. Each collection has had about six or seven different styles in it. Yeah. Um, and most use um, Pinatex, or, which is the pineapple fiber, 
or we've used washable paper, which is another amazing invention of the textile gods. And then we line everything in eco-poly or eco-preen as we call it, which feels like a wetsuit material, but it's made out of recycled carpet and recycled polyester and recycled water bottles, for example. And they're all, I mean, the, the, the cardboard and the paper that you said, they can make that tough enough? Yeah, they can. Okay. And if you bond it correctly, um, you're, we, we use it for many different applications. I'm trying to think what I can show you, but we use it for either making the bag stand upright or yeah. giving it a slouchy feel, depending on how it's um, applied. Okay. So the, um, the, the designs themselves, they come out of just your mind, your creative spirit, your um, yeah. just, just from what you're thinking at the time? Yeah, the designs themselves were whatever I would like to be carrying. Yeah. One, uh, we have a bit of a joke within the business because Susie being the sales London gal, she started the brand strictly because she was looking for a cream clutch to take to a wedding. And okay. um, as all Brits do, she was going to wear a hat. And a, <laughs> every time we talk about weddings, she says, I'll get a hat. <laughs> so <laughs> she wanted a cream clutch and a hat for a wedding. And she couldn't find a cream clutch that wasn't plastic and wasn't leather. So we... That's basically how designs sort of come together is, you know, what do we need? What do we want? A big one for us was that we wanted to be able to carry our laptops. We wanted to be able to, you know, I'm not someone who can usually get around with a small clutch. They're not really my, I can't fit everything in them. So we actually yeah. started to try and make this cream clutch for the wedding. And halfway through first design, I sort of said to Susie, well, we can't put a keep cup, a cloth bag or a water bottle in this, so I don't know on who on earth we're selling it to if we can't carry it ourselves. Yeah. Um, and that's been one of our um, probably big, biggest pushes is to make sure that all things are sort of accounted for. Okay, yeah. But yeah, that's, that's the design phase. The procurement and innovation phase of developing these bags has been the tougher journey. So trying to keep them simple design, the procurement's the, the challenge. I wanted to ask where you think the future of all this is, is headed in a second, but... Mm. The other element of a lot of this stuff is not only getting the right products to start with, but it's how it's treated along the way, which I know you touched on just mm -hmm. a, a second ago. Do you also look at that element to see what the um, ramifications of that is? Because you can take a natural product and you know some of the faults of some of these early things were probably along these lines, and then but you've got to so harshly treat them or um, you know whatever mm -hmm. to get them to a usable stage mm -hmm. so you've got to make sure that's right as well which obviously you you're saying you address right yeah not only that so one part of procuring the materials is mm -hmm. making sure that you're looking at the entire supply chain and how that looks from a raw materials how the people are treated when they're when we're collecting the um, pineapple plant leaves yes. um, all the way through to how they're produced and then how they're shipped so you know, we and we provide and go through that quite regularly. It's something that we're really passionate about to make sure that the farmers who are farming the pineapples, for example, yes. it's such an interesting story, the Pinatex story. I'll briefly tell you about it. But essentially, the founder of Pinatex saw that um, pineapple fibers were such a fi um, strong material yeah. and were able to create this non woven fabric. So they then set about creating these. Um, parts of the villages to sorry in the philippines where they collect the leaves yes they ensured that the farmers were able to then sell the leaves for extra money and to okay. when they're making that pineapple leaf fiber they can create a biogas that they can then run their tractors with and sell the biogas back to the factory so there's oh, back to the farm oh, in the village that's pretty cool so it's like yeah it just keeps it's a another form of income that was already unrealized really yeah and the other element of, of all this is also the transport costs after they're made which is another big factor because you can Hugely. give away all your advantage just yep. if you have to ship the product too far it's not shipped in an economical way yep. and, and all that sort of stuff as well yeah so. so we use a carbon neutral delivery partner which is something that was i didn't even not know yeah, they uh, existed they so do there you go. and the big guys do it too now which has been you know a sign at the times okay um, it's sort of like how you, well, it's not really like how you can click, but when you buy a, a airline ticket and you click, do you want to make this CO2 
reduction yeah, offset your carbon offset credits, your yeah. carbon credits. Yeah. yeah do you want to do that it's sort of like that except that you know people such as even dhl have a carbon neutral delivery service now that you can opt for okay we work with a business called sendal for our courier oh yeah but it is a um very interesting conversation for an example and i joked about this with my partner this morning when i was i ran into an old family friend over the summer mm-hmm or a family friend's father, and he said, oh, so what are you up to these days? And I said, oh, I'm doing this handbag brand. And I showed him one of the bags, and I said, oh, it's made of pineapple leaves and water bottles. And his first question was, well, if you're making them overseas, what about the emissions to bring it back to Australia? And it really angered me because I just turned to him and I said, well, Henry, if I was to show you a leather handbag and you and told you that it was 40-day-old Angus beef leather, and, I, and, and here's my handbag, would you ask me about the emissions or yeah. would you say, that's a good looking bag? Yeah. And he went bright red and he, and he said, you know what, you're right, I wouldn't have even thought about it. But it's that slippery slope conversation. Yeah. It's such a, it's a really challenging space to be in because what we don't need is 100 people doing things perfectly. What we need is tens of millions of people doing things imperfectly with the right intention. So yes. yeah, that's the only way we're going to create any sort of change. And it's such an interesting thing to put yourself out there as a fashion designer or anyone in this day and age and say you're doing something with the, for the good of X, Y, and Z and then be ready to field all the questions. <laughs> yeah, you stick your neck out, right? You've got you to um, got to be expect, I suppose, in some ways, rightly or wrongly, that uh, you know someone will take a swing from time to time. Yeah, so. and and we, and I welcome the questions, but it, but you know maybe it was that I'd had a, enough of, of the Christmas conversations. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah maybe. but you know it it really is such an interesting one to think about. Emissions definitely are f- so important, and we actually, as part of our business and and our major ethos is is. A level of social enterprise so we donate five dollars of every sale for every handbag back to ocean regeneration so i don't know if you know this but the um the ocean is the biggest pro- provider of oxygen and we yeah. need it obviously because it's a carbon sequestration um yes. field yeah um it's which we're covering we all, day by day with more and more plastic right which reduces its effectiveness so we are. yeah and when they were feeding the fish with the plastic and um we're losing the forests, the sea forests under the water, which is what eats the carbon in uh, eating. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so it's it's a really interesting one. So part of our another part of our business is a give back program where we invest or donate to foundations who are improving the health of our planet and more specifically the ocean. So what sort of price do these bags sell for roughly? I know it probably changes over time from collection to collection and piece to piece, but is there a sort of a have you got where do you sit at the moment in terms of price? So our competitors came into the market um, probably about six months before us with an 800 to $900 handbag. Okay. For us, we didn't, we don't, that's not where we sit as consumers. Yeah. We think that if you're a con- conscious consumer, you will buy the right product, but you're not going to spend $900 on a handbag any longer. Yeah. So we made our highest price point bag at four hundred dollars okay. and our entry price point at one hundred dollars so we sort of fill the market for a young girl who who's aware and wants to buy something that's unique and still satisfies all of her values yeah. and the older woman who still has the money to spend on a good handbag but also cares um, about its how it's made and where it's made so i wanted to ask your brand is ahisma have i got that right ahimsa ahimsa sorry mm-hmm. um who is the who is the person that buys this brand? Do you have you profiled that, that we, we ideal client? We did at the start, yeah. and then we realised that she's actually comes in many different forms, and she may have found us from looking okay. from a cruelty free perspective, where we're not using animal products, therefore she we satisfy that box for her, yeah. or she's she's still a meat eater, but she knows that to make a change, she has to do choose things that are more sustainable. So it's not really a surprise any longer for us as a society to discuss veganism and the impact that um, meat consumption has on the planet. But I'm not the sort of person, and neither of us in our business are the sort of people who um, who need you to be vegan to buy a bag. You just need to care about the planet that you live on. Yeah. Um, you know, we could all make a change by reducing our meat intake from five times a week to two times a week if you know if we wanted to do something like that it's not about veganism in our brand it's about sustainability okay 
Yeah, because you're right. I wanted to actually ask you about how you make your choices just in um, in general day-to-day mm-hmm. sort of like living, right? Because I think you're right that to get everyone to change 360 is very, very difficult mm-hmm. and will probably never happen. But if you can even, as you're saying, um, use a little less, mm-hmm. eat, eat, eat a little less meat or whatever, um, change the paper instead of plastic and all that sort of mm-hmm. stuff. So how do you think as you, as, as you go forward? Because I've got a bit of a kind of a theory on this mm-hmm. but um, I'm, I'm interested in in how you sort of uh, judge your decisions like do you feel like if you have to get in the car and drive somewhere do you feel bad that you're sending gases into the environment like yep. how, do, how do you process that each day mentally um i was thinking about this this morning actually as well i i guess from a car perspective every, you know we all should be driving less um I don't benchmark it off well i'm doing better than someone else but yeah. often i i like to make sure that I'm choosing better compared to what's in the supermarket. So I'll choose the best possible product that's in the supermarket. I still shop in supermarkets if I'm not shopping in the farmer's market. Yeah. I'll buy everything in plastic-free alternatives. To, mm-hmm. You know, my bananas don't need to go in plastic bags and I don't buy pre-cut vegetables. Yeah. Much to my partner's dismay when we first met, he <laughs> used to think that it would be great if someone else could just chop them up for him. He'd never buy them in plastic, but if someone else could chop up his veggies, he'd be a much happier person. Yes. Um, so they're the main key things is just, you know, we haven't changed our ways in that we, we still shop in the major supermarkets when, when necessary, yep. but we will buy the most sustainable alternative. And a lot of the packaging these days has changed dramatically, yep. um, but that's how we live our day to day. We still have to travel a bit for work, yep. which is a challenge. We do offset it where we can yep. um, and we're by no means perfect. We're just trying to make the best of what we can do and make sure we're at the forefront of what's available and to really facilitate and aid transformation and innovation and give the market you know, an option. Because there's this move, a bit of a trend right towards like minimalism and stuff, mm-hmm. which I think is a big jump for, for some people. But Huge. I think if you, with everything that you do and consume and, and even the way you move about society on, on a mm-hmm. day-to-day basis... If you actually think about why you're doing it, that can go a long way to saving a lot of time, effort, and mm-hmm. money, right? Like it's not yep. even about the, the whole thing's not about being good just for the environment. There's also a lot of other factors that, that right. come out of that, right? Yep. So for me, the way I try to think about it is that if you, you know, if you choose that product, know why you're choosing it, yeah, and and try and know you know what's behind it, and not to the point where you want to, you know not drive your car or, or be stressed about it or, or mm-hmm. whatever but just just if you have that in your thinking that why am i doing this is this the best way can mm-hmm. you know can we go with one less bottle of water can we go to the tap instead of that can we walk around the corner instead of drive all of those things can add up to be a big difference Huge right thing. so i just think that if we can go a little bit more in that direction with our thinking mm-hmm. then the outcome for everyone is going to be you know a lot better well, it all comes down to education, doesn't it? Of the course, more yeah. we educate ourselves and the more as designers we educate our consumers. I mean, the last thing in the world that designers want is for people to stop consuming. That's not that's not why the designer was put on the planet. Yes. Um, you know, we 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 totally recognize and appreciate and support minimalism, but that's not going to help us as um designers or developers or business owners or industry or any economy to survive so what we actually need is to be educating and talking to people about what goes into each of our products and i think that's a really big um, societal change that we need to see even from um, any developed product development i think there needs to be a whole overhaul on what that looks like when you're being taught how to develop something i know when i was at university i was studying fashion and i was never taught to consider how many litres and kilograms of what what looks like in cotton. If I'm to order 800 pairs of jeans, what does that actually look like from a farming perspective and what sort of what happens to the soil and what happens to the farmer? You know, that's not part of the education. Yeah. And it needs to be yeah. because you are you are directly responsible for what that looks like and you don't even know it 
And I think that's the consciousness that you're sort of talking about. It's not just the consumer wanting to buy better. It's the designer who needs to design better. And we all just need to do that little bit better and that will make a huge amount of change and quickly. Yes. You know, yeah, no, I agree. I, yeah, 100%. So where is your industry going? What are the trends we can see in the future? There's going to be a lot more development. I would, I'm thinking just out loud here around the, uh, the, the fabrics and that that goes into the bags. Yeah. Is that gonna? Is it gonna continue? What's what are yeah. we gonna see? So I think we're gonna start seeing. Well, I hope we're gonna start seeing um, a overhaul of how designers operate. I think yeah. that they need. To, we will be as designers. Will be it'll be uh, our responsibility and ownership to make sure that whatever we're producing has an end of life plan for it. So, for example, with our handbags. We have a give back program where you can send us back your bags. Yep. We'll give you a 30% off your next purchase and we will oh, dispose wow. of it, take it apart, recycle it, dispose of it properly, yep. melt it back down, create more plastic. Plastic's so interesting because it's it's an oil and yes. it can be used and used and used again if it's not if it's a mono blend so if it's it's, it's sorry if it's a mono fabric, not yes. a blend. Yep. Um, I think that we'll start seeing the industry whether it's consumer demand making it more sustainable or just it the industry itself realizing what it's responsible for i mean if we don't change our industry by 2050 a quarter of all carbon emissions will be coming from the fashion industry alone that is mind-boggling so they're increasing the emissions rather than even if, flattening or yeah or if we're not if we don't change as if we keep going on the path we're on right now the yep. trajectory we're on right now and we don't make any changes that's what it's going to look like in 2050. Because I suppose as the world as a whole becomes um, aware, more, well, I suppose more wealthy for you know, yeah, overall, then because we have the ability, we tend to consume more, mm-hmm. which means that it puts pressure back on the you know, it goes mm-hmm. all the way down the line, right? Yeah. And then you just create more of what you have been creating in the past. So that's right. Very, um, it's an exponential curve we're on here. It's not just that we're going to head in the same direction. It actually gets a lot worse unless we yeah. unless we change. Well, especially so. from a um, global warming or climate change perspective and the instability stability that we're already seeing. Yeah. Um, part of, you know, I talk about being a fashion designer, but I also am very avidly involved in um, climate protesting and climate change activism. So okay. I spent a week last year with um, Vice President Al Gore in the Climate Reality Project conference, learning and um, and basically upskilling myself to be able to speak eloquently about climate change to my peers and my and I'm not doing a good job of speaking very eloquently right now, oh. <laughs> but um, talking about carbon sequestration and how we can make change you know, as, as people and as a community and as a society. Um, I think that from an industry perspective, it was fantastic and fascinating to be in that room with all of the scientists in, of uh, who are already subscribed to climate change being real, which yes. is a whole nother debate. <laughs> I yes. don't even know how it's possibly a debate, but anyway. Um, and, and being able to communicate with them from a fashion perspective and, yeah. and looking at fashion even from a farming perspective and how that influences the land and what that looks like going all the way back down to soil again. So I have to ask, Yep. How, what was Al Gore like? <laughs> can you talk a little bit about the days that you spent yes, um, you can ask. With, with, uh, with him and um, obviously one of the really, uh, I suppose, um, figureheads behind you know climate change yes. and one of the early ones too. Yeah, pioneer, 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 yeah. pioneer of this movement. Um, he was probably... Well, goodness, he can speak. He made me cry. I, didn't, I don't think I had a day where I didn't cry. It was eye-opening in that it was almost frustrating. He gave presentations every day about climate change and how this is already happening right now. Um, my dad loves to say things like, well, you know, when someone says electric cars are the future, he says electric cars are the now. This is yeah. now. This is happening now. Yeah. It's not about it. You know, it's a very interesting way of looking at things. Um, Al Gore, he is passionate and he's classic politician. You know, he's selling this story that's real and it and yeah. it's heartbreaking, but it needs to have activism around it. He said a couple of things. He said one thing that said um, one quote that he that I wrote down straight away was, "This means the world to me that you're here." This literally means the world. And I just thought, you know, if you could have anyone championing 
this this fight that we're up against it's the politician like a vice president al gore to do so yes um it was exciting to be able to be in this room of 800 people being trained to um talk about these sorts of things within our industry and change the shape of what our industry currently looks like we talked about carbon cuts and carbon taxes and how that looks from a um, industry standpoint Mm -hmm. and whether or not we can implement that and perhaps that's something that we look at from a metric to measure so when you're so we're working with Levi's for example and Levi's have a great sustainability program about them Mm -hmm. and you know whether or not you say back down to your 800 pairs of denim that you're ordering when this designer orders this this is what it equals and so we can then start to measure it and reduce our um, footprint that way. Yep. So Al Gore... Rather than overproduce and then give it to you know, a Costco-like sort of business to, right. to you know to get rid of yeah, to the next to no money. Precisely. One thing that he said that really stuck out to me was that he said, I'm a capitalist. I'm a green capitalist. And the only way that I'm going to see this to change is when the cost of being green is cheaper than it is to not be green and i Mm. love that which is happening right it is happening i've had this well this has come up um a couple times on the on the podcast now and that's really the barrier the the cost barrier you have to cross right because it's still going to take a little bit of time for some people to catch up Mm -hmm. to the you know now cheaper and better way of doing things um, and producing better results at the end of it too you know in a lot of cases but that's where we're going to see it it really flip right and i mean the car industry is a good one we're now seeing um porsche has got their electric and, mm-hmm. and hybrid models i mean mm-hmm. one of the highest luxury yeah. high end luxury brands you know there is yeah. are now doing these things so there's no doubt that we're that we're there yeah um but it's going to be really interesting to see how it, how it all all plays out and the changes in the and in the innovation that's going to you know mm. that the likes of of you and others are, are working on it's going to be um it's going to be super interesting going forward so well i think and it was interesting my five days with the climate reality project was so inspiring but it was also incredibly frustrating and it left me feeling really really depleted in a way because we already know the answers to these problems and yeah. we just can't get the politicians to change things and we can't get governance to make these calls that we know we need to do. Yes. And I think, so after our, after my conference week, I sat in on a beach for five days and tried to switch off because I had been quite, quite heartbroken to know that this is already, the solutions are already there, mm. but that doesn't stop you from needing to use your voice. I needed the five days to to, to unwind and process yeah, it. Yeah, to process it all and then get straight back into yeah, it. Yeah, I, I, I should put you in touch with uh, Rob Joe. He's been on this yeah. podcast as we as we discussed earlier because um, he he is uh, singing from the exact same hymn book, right? Yeah, like, we know what to do. We do. It's just a matter of actually doing it. And now that what we should be doing, mm. you know, as we said before, is also cost less with better results. Like, why why aren't we? So um, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm happy to do that, yeah. and uh, and and the more the more people working on this, the, the the better. You know, I think it's um, if we have the best interests of the planet and world in mind, well, mm-hmm. then there's no you know it's, it's what possibly can come not from. to yeah. yeah yeah exactly and exactly right. Obviously, there's a transitional phase in that, and how does that look from a societal standpoint? Do we how do we convince or how do we show the society the the people who work in the mining industry or the fossil fuel industry that they are supported and that a transition into renewables still gives them a job and still allows them to um, earn a living and live a healthy and happy life how do we convince them or or show them that this is possible and that's you know really why we've got banging on the doors of parliaments and saying this is your job to be able to show the security is there. Yeah. Unfortunately, we've seen that bigger businesses are now doing it for themselves because they know that this is changing. And we're seeing um, a whole bunch of different policies being written within big business who know that society will turn their backs if, if they're not seen to be doing the right thing just because parliamentarians are not actively doing things. Yeah. I mean, we've just had three or four weeks of the worst bushfires in recorded history. So we know that this is a real thing. We just need to see some big change yes absolutely with your collections and that that you do do you do limited um 
runs of them and then do you do you sell prior and 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 how does that sort of i know we're jumping around a bit here but no, that's okay but uh how, how does that work no i'm happy to go back to product always <laughs> product developer um it's so interesting we do a pre-order we like to not overproduce. obviously that's such a big big part of producing a sustainable product is that you need to know who's going to buy it so that you're not making too many of it and then having to as you said, put it on sale or pop it at Costco's or however it looks from a clearance mm-hmm. perspective. We do limited edition ranges as well. One thing that we came, we started with was called the dead stock collection or trash bags. And that is because we have um, hangers worth of dead stock material here in Australia that fashion designers have over purchased and then not been able to use all of and we and it's being basically put in landfill so at the start of our brand in unison with um pinatex and a little surprise thing we're about to release in the next few weeks is a campaign around dead stock material and what that looks like if you put it into landfill or if you use it as a product and then responsibly dispose of it so dead stock is a very interesting conversation and there's many different opinions that you can have on it one is that by selling dead stock to young designers you're encouraging big brands to over order which i completely reject i don't think that big brands are deliberately over ordering to be able to sell leftovers to small designers but Mm. that's one conversation um dead stock is is the same in any industry i guess it doesn't refer to just fabric vinyl or offcuts but it's that concept of overordering and then not knowing what to do with it. Yep. So we've got a range called the Trash Bag Range coming out in a few weeks, which okay. shows the journey of how we found it in the hangers. We've given access to these hangers full of crap yes, and okay. what we could do with them to turn them into a luxury product that someone could feel good about carrying, knowing that it's not no longer going to landfill. I can only assume getting to know you a little bit now that that's mm-hmm. probably... Um, pretty exciting part of the yeah. journey right like taking this hanger full of stuff and you know all right what can we what can we create here yeah so, it's like getting a yoga mats and your abseiling ropes like yeah. what can we create that looks the same as everyone else but actually has a better backbone do you do you feel for yourself um that you ever do you run the risk of taking on too much <laughs> Yeah. I, know, I mean, I know that's just business in general. You kind of like have to, right? In, no, in that's a, lot a good of ways. segue actually because I've just um, launched another business as well, which I haven't told you about, so I'm sort of sideswiping you here. Okay, tell me, tell um, me. I'm prepared to be sideswiped. <laughs> <laughs> it's a basics brand. It's called The Common Good Company and it's a okay. recycled cotton, recycled poly basics brand. And here, she says as she reaches into her bag, yes. is an example of recycled materials. Oh, awesome. Okay. So this is, for those listening and not watching, this is a, oh, an upside down t-shirt. So, <laughs> this way. so this is a this is a t-shirt. Tell this us about the material that goes... So it's 60% it. recycled cotton, 40% recycled polyester. It's called the Common Good Company. Okay. And it is um, using textile waste. So pre-consumer, cutting room floor yarn that's been spun back into a new yarn and then mixed with... Um, post-consumer water bottles and recycled carpets and polyester to make the yarn thicker but okay. tell me you've got it in your hand does it feel like it's recycled it, it doesn't it feels soft um i mean it looks great it's obviously this is, this is a white one we've got here but um you'd if it was know. on the rack next to something else you'd never know the difference that's like, right to, to be quite honest so i'm assuming that the functionality of the the material not that it's something i know a lot about but um is is similar if not if not better. Yep, absolutely. And so awesome. in the inside of this little tag here, this you'll here, see yep. what each T-shirt represents. So it's a planet saving of 2,700 litres of fresh water, which oh, yeah, is got, the yeah, amount okay. that a, an adult would drink a year of fresh 170 water. 170 grams of textile waste. Mm-hmm. So that is uh, offcuts, chemicals, yep. all that sort of stuff that you would normally have left over from the production of, mm-hmm. of you know, um, clothes so, normally. Yep. And then you've got 4.5 plastic oh, water bottles Yeah, pulled from so landfill. Goes to each T-shirt. Okay. So this is where I think textile innovation and the way our industry is going, yeah. which is in line with the handbags in that we're using resources that already exist and creating new ones. So this is 100%? Recycled. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. And so really, this... That, yeah, really good. <laughs> so it's mind-blowing because... 
how many brands do you think print their values on a t-shirt and then go out to sell it to make their profits so when you look at businesses you know it's such a it's a statement of our generation we wear our values on our clothes we brand it might be a sea shepherd t-shirt that you're wearing or a polished man t-shirt or whatever it is that you charity that you believe in or cause um and we print them on virgin material which undoes all of the good work that they're trying to achieve um not those two businesses that i just mentioned they're much more mindful but it is part of you know there's not been an option in the market until 2019 or a little earlier where we're able to now put it into a mass production of textile waste and stopping it from going into land and turning it into something new that can be used again and again Um, and the t-shirt itself is recyclable as well which is really interesting we can now turn that into bed linen and carpets and rugs and home furnishing and is that the plan yeah that is the plan so my question was yeah, whether you ever get tired. <laughs> well, 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 you, you kind of can't when you're in business, right? Um, no. I can. I know that from personal experience. Yes. Even if you feel it, you can't. But anyway, um, so I asked you if there's a danger that you're that you're trying to do too much, too much. and then you've responded with another thing that you're doing. <laughs> so is there a is is there a danger? Or? There is. No, there is, and that's why I'm so lucky to have partners who are the finance side of things and the operations and I can focus on the creativity and making sure that what I'm producing I can have owners for and I think that we do spread ourselves too thin as as entrepreneurs and that's why we need to make sure we've really chosen the right people to work with to make sure that the cogs are still turning and that it's still a sustainable business profitability and from an environmental standpoint Um, and also, I am a big believer in doing one thing and doing one thing well, which you wouldn't believe because I have two very environmentally focused businesses. But I, um, we only do two collections for handbags a year. Yeah. And we, um, so that gives my focus to wholeheartedly to how they're developed and what that looks like. Yeah. Really excitingly, our hardware is all recycled metal as well on our handbags, which I didn't even mention, which okay. is all pretty crazy, to be yeah. honest with you. But yes. that's the blessing of being in 2020. And with our T-shirts, again, once I'm a pattern maker by trade, once I've got the cut correct, I don't need to make a change. I just need to make sure that it's being seen and used by the right people so that I can replace. It's Because it is literally is to be a replacement for virgin cotton. So who are the right people that you want? Everyone and anyone who wants to buy a T-shirt. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Listeners, no. Yes. Um, <laughs> the right people are the people who are already printing on blank T-shirts and are looking for... Oh, yeah. okay. um, replacement and in terms of um something in like businesses or whatever mm-hmm. you want to print on be, be a great choice um and in terms of cost are you, are you again are you there or thereabouts wholesale. yeah we are okay. a wholesale company we also do a direct to consumer price so okay. we sell a black a printed t-shirt like this for 40 dollars. yeah direct to consumer and you can buy them on the online website or you can send us an email which their website will direct you to which is for wholesale pricing because we recognize that a lot of people want to get their business out there and then they want to be able to on sell it yep. and so it comes so you can print up your own brand with um, onto our t-shirts and make your own profits that way okay so if somebody wants to sort of um, get new uniforms or whatever precisely you know, yeah, okay, yeah that's a awesome yeah so awesome it can idea. be a plumbing business or it could be a roofing business or it yes. could be a cafe or it could be a school yes. or you know it's anyone that would be printing um and currently there's only really a couple of providers out there yep. and none of them really nail the sustainability side of things necessarily yes it's an yes. interesting one you're looking at a two dollar t-shirt for some people then because they're seeing profit to be able to um where their values on their clothes but the value needs to come from the t-shirt itself as well yeah it's a shift in mindset isn't it and we all even i mean the big brands you know um we we buy nike stuff because we want to feel like we're an athlete right that's right it's, you know and we think we're one when we, when we put it on like that's the thing we're kind of buying right yeah and, you know full credit to them and the the branding that they've done and one of the biggest companies in the world and biggest brands mm-hmm. in the world they've done it really well but as the this mindset and our education gets better in this space, I think we're going to have a lot more people mm. thinking along these lines and kind of is, you know, it kind of sounds cool to wear water bottles and, yeah. and that and not... Uh, and textile waste. Yeah, why, why not? I think yeah. it's uh, I think it's super cool. So this is, again, um, the um, the website is, which for this? It's the Common Good Company. So it's thecommongoodco.com. 
Oh, very good. Okay. Mm. And Ahimsa, what's the website there? So this is Ahimsa Collective. So it's A-H-I-M-S-A, Ahimsa. And the word Ahimsa is actually a Sanskrit word meaning no harm. So we use it to apply it to the people, the planet and the animals. So it's um, a bit of a triple threat word, but it's ahimsacollective.com. Perfect. Now, for you, Tessie, yourself... Mm-hmm. Are you a planner? Do you look at the next five or ten years of where you might might be or where you where you want to go, and what does that what does that look like? I am a planner. I'm a um, visual board sort of drawer. Yes. And probably how I landed myself here today because I did that five years ago, um, and I've just drawn my next one out. And my plans are to keep developing and keep working on textile innovation that can curb the problems we've already got within the industry yeah. and sharing them. I think that the only okay. way we're going to create change is to share these innovations and I think keeping them up our sleeves is is not going to make not going to see the change that we need quick enough anyway. You want to keep sharing that's um, oh, that's awesome. Sharing. Now a question that I do ask everybody mm-hmm. as we sort of pull this to a bit of a close if you could have one law changed or implemented what would it be? Ooh, well, you wouldn't, well, from a design perspective, I've got a couple of answers to that. Yes. But from a global or societal perspective, I would suggest that we ceased subsidizing fossil fuel companies and started to transition into renewables and how that looks. Because for every product that we develop we've got an energy cost to it and if we can at least say that it's made from renewable energy we're already making a far quicker and faster and um, larger change in how we develop our products and then from a design perspective from implementation it would be my dream that designers are taught what their product looks like at its end of life and how we can get it back to its raw materials so a law perspective that um, from a law pers- legal perspective that you cannot produce a product if you do not have the capacity to return it to its traditional or raw material to be reused again. Okay, so be be a custodian of the raw materials That's right. rather than a user of them. That's right, yeah. So we, you know, if I've produced this T-shirt, I need to know what can be done with it afterwards and I need as a business to be able to provide the consumer with a method to get it back to me. Sounds good. Now, you mentioned a documentary earlier. I want to ask the name of it, the one that you watched and then went vegan. Just it for my own interest. It's called Cowspiracy. Oh, yeah. I've watched it. Yeah. Yeah. And it was my... Very uh, very popular when it first came out, that that, that documentary. And that changed your whole... Yeah, that flipped me. I think it made me realize that I'm not someone who drops rubbish on the ground. So why would I be continuing to eat what I was eating when it had a far greater effect on the land? The next one that I watched, and documentaries are very interesting to me because I feel that I must obviously learn a lot more from the, the emotive music that goes behind them. No, yes. I um, the other one that led me to Ahimsa Collective was A Plastic Ocean, and it was the amount of plastic okay. that we see in the ocean yep. and what that looks like in our food chain and how that's affecting our land and um, animals and global eco- ecosystem. Um, so that would be my... Um, my those two last two but one that yeah. we're about to show on Sunday night this week is called yes. 2040. 2040 and I don't know if you've seen it yet but it's an insight in what the world could look like in 2040 if we make some changes now so you're saying that you're showing we're screening it yep we're, we're we run in Richmond oh okay so this is a this is a movie that is being a documentary so that's being released yeah I haven't heard of it so yeah um, so it's what it is it's a documentary it's yeah. Australian film Okay. It's essentially through the eyes of what the world could look like in 2040. Yes. And it's really uplifting and compelling and shows how we can actually make a change. And okay. one of the things that we do at Ahimsa Collective and at the Common Good Company, obviously, because it's one and the same, yes. is to show documentaries and spike the conversation and educate to empower because it's okay. the only way that we're going to see change. We need to present the problem and then provide the solution. So they're things that awesome. we show on us on our websites. They're, they're, we're always holding screenings and getting like-minded people together or people who are just interested and don't know anyone. Okay. This documentary screening on Sunday night is a film fundraiser. So for the Bushfire Appeal. So that's a, you said on your website, was that location-based? It's going to be on your... This will be in... It, we show the details on the website, but okay. this is in Richmond on Sunday night at 5 p.m. Okay. 
Got it. So is there anything else that you want to add before we do wrap this up? The only thing that I would add is to make sure that you do keep consuming because it keeps the um, businesses alive and it keeps us on our toes to keep um, developing and changing and innovating. Mm -hmm. But most importantly, look into what you're buying and put your money where your values are. Awesome. Vote with your wallet. Well, I want to, yeah, that's the the most effective way of voting, right? Mm-hmm. In, from uh, for for a lot of different um, from a lot of different perspectives. Well, Tessa, I want to uh, thank you for being here today. I ad- admire what you're doing, the thought that goes into it. Um, the more people like you that we that we have going around, the better. I, I really think that we'll that we'll all be. So, from a business perspective, from a sustainability perspective, from a, just a general good perspective. Um, yeah, as I say, I do I do admire what you're doing, and I really look forward to seeing. Um, well, I'm going to get some of these t-shirts first of all. So start wearing some of these bottles that uh, you're pulling back and and uh, giving them a good go. That'd be I'm looking forward to doing that. But um, yeah, again, thank you, thank you for what you're doing, and um, and thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I've loved every minute of it.